Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to your new day, new session. Uh, let me just start off this session with a word of prayer. Uh, so can any one of us please lead us in prayer? Samuel, can you lead us in prayer? Sure, Pastor. Yeah, thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Uh, we thank you for this providence uh, where we could come together and learn uh, about church history and missions. We could uh, uh, learn from uh, Pastor Paul and Emmanuel and uh, we dedicate Pastor into your hands. Uh, Holy Spirit, fill him, fill him with your wisdom, with your understanding, with your peace. And every word that comes out of his mouth uh, inspires us, equips us, builds us um, for your kingdom, Lord. Uh, we dedicate everyone who's present in this class May your spirit, uh, your understanding, your peace be upon us uh, so that we can pay attention, uh, we can uh, learn, uh, we can be inspired, um, and we remain faithful to all these learnings um, so that we can uh, extend your kingdom, we can be a channel of your blessing, and we can bless uh, uh, others who are in need of you. Thank you again. We dedicate uh, this time, this hour. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Samuel. Okay. Uh, let's just do a little bit of a review of what we did uh, uh, yesterday. Okay. Uh, yesterday we saw how God used simple people, uh, people who had nothing with them, no financial backing, people who had no high qualifications, yet God used them so powerfully. We looked at the layman's revival, how God used laymen with a burden in their heart to pray in the afternoons during their work time. And those meetings went up to 10,000s of people that eventually the entire world was following this timing of prayer. Uh, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Britain, uh, Germany, uh, hundreds of places, people gathered together. So there was uh, a move of the Holy Spirit there. And we also looked at revival in England, uh, how God raised up uh, missionaries and evangelists like Charles Spurgeon, D.L. Moody. And we looked at three uh, wonderful women of God who, you know, God so powerfully used. One was Mary Slessor, who went into Africa. And again, they were able to do so much with just less facilities, less financial backup. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Mary Slessor herself went into Africa, abolished the whole thing of uh, killing of twins, uh, set up orphanages there, uh, and set up educational institutions as well in Africa. Then we also looked at Amy Carmichael, who came to India as a missionary volunteered in China, then came to India, uh, came to South India, spent 55 years of her life just serving the poor, serving the uh, uh, you know orphaned children. She also began to rescue children and girls and men, boys from uh, temple prostitution. And, uh, and, and, and then she also raised up many orphanages as well. Uh, and then the third woman that we looked at was uh, Ida Scudder. Uh, Ida Scudder, who did a wonderful work. She was in India. She went to the U.S., studied, came back, started a, a you know a medical dispensary in a small way. Later moved to a 200-acre land uh, now known as the CMC Christian Medical Center, Velour. So, from all that we've you know read and we studied so evident that sometimes god if god has to use us he re he expects us to just step out into the unknown uh step out into out of our comfort zone right so there will be times when god will ask us to step out of our comfort zone so you know especially now during these days uh you know, comfort is something that is very easily acquired, 
right? Even, even during these times, we don't have to struggle, Lord. And praise God for that. Praise God for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, you know, the equipment and the things that we have that help to live a comfortable life. Praise God for that. But this comfortable life should not stop us or should not be a hindrance from us to, you know, step out into the unknown, step out into what God is calling us to do. You know, uh, yesterday uh, uh, we were just, during our family prayer, we were praying and uh, I was reminded of, you know, it's been four years here in Mangalore, this April, coming year, April 2022 will be four years. So I was reminded, you know, I thought, uh, how did we, you know, we left everyone in Bangalore. We are actually from Bangalore. So we, we moved from Bangalore to a city of, of course, it's not a big change. It's not something that, you know, I moved to a different country or, uh, but, you know, I had a one-year-old boy at that time and uh, we moved to Mangalore. It was not easy, right? A lot of films uh, within the church asked me, Paul, how are you going to manage? Uh, there's nobody in Mangalore. There, you don't know anyone. Uh, there's no family. There's no friends. You've got two small kids. How are you going to manage? Uh, yes, when you think of it in the natural Yes, it's very difficult. And, uh, you know, it's always good to be with family and be with people that you know. But when you think of it in the natural, it becomes a difficulty. And you feel that, okay, uh, it's better I stay here in, in, the, in my comfort zone. But God is always a God who takes us out of our comfort zone, right? Uh, so, so when we pray, when we ask God, he, when he leads us to certain things, prayerfully consider them. Right. Uh, so even as we moved to Mangalore, it was very difficult, very, very difficult. Right. We were about 10 people in the church uh, and the weather was different. The people were different and, and the culture here is different and everything was so different. And we had two small children. And, you know, but when we look back, we're so grateful that we allowed God to help us make this change. Right uh, now, the reason I'm sharing this is because sometimes um, we get comfortable in our in our place, right? In our, of course, we all have a calling, we all have our gifts, but uh, God expects us, right? And we look at these wonderful men, women of God. They came out of their comfort zone. Even as we look from the first century, we saw how even due the through the Roman Catholic oppression. Uh, it did not deter them. People came out of their gum. People were willing to do something and leave a mark uh, for the sake of the gospel. And we see here also such wonderful men and women of God letting go of all the uh, you know comforts that they were in. They were in developed countries, but they were willing to go into smaller cities and towns smaller countries, underdeveloped countries, and minister the gospel. And because of these people, you know, we have, uh, you know, a, a greater, uh, uh, you know, way of reaching out to people. We have the gospel being spread in these countries here, in our nation as well, in India. Uh, so it's such a joy, you know, to uh, actually, if you study about Ida Scudder, who started the CMC, she was so upset with her parents because she used to tell her parents, why did you come to India? Out of all the places, what made you all to come to India? Couldn't you have chosen a different country? Because when she was young as a small girl, she saw uh, girls being ill-treated. She saw girls being, you know, kidnapped and, uh, uh, you know, sexually assaulted and all these things. She has seen it uh, when she was in India. So she used to tell her parents, why did you come to India? Can we go from here? But her parents were like, no. We, are, we have come here, we will live here, we will die here itself. And, and so when she went to America to study, she was very happy. She said, I'm never going to step foot into India again. But God had different plans. You know, God just touched her heart. She came back to India. And even now, Christian Medical Center uh, is one of the largest hospitals in our nation and even in Asia. They boast of the best equipment, best uh, a rate, highest rate of, uh, you know, recoveries as well. So, uh, so it's really encouraging to study these. Uh, let's move on. Let's look at a few more, uh, 
you know, missionaries and few more revivals. And after that, uh, maybe next class, we will we will uh, look at some of the key observations. Um, so we've done all these. We've we've completed from the first century church to date. Uh, so what were what are the key observations? Maybe that we'll look into at the next class. So let's pick up from where we stop, page fifty-two, uh, and we're going to start with Smith Wigglesworth. Now, Smith Wigglesworth was uh, uh, in the early uh, mid eighteen hundreds. Now, God called him as an apostle of faith, and he was used by God to heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. So, Smith Wigglesworth was a short man, very dynamic in his speech. Right? It is said that he had like you know microphones in his uh, vocal cords. He was he was so uh, you know valiant in his work, and uh, you know he uh, it is said that he would uh, he would st stay up nights day and night just praying for the sick uh, and many times they people did not receive healing many times people received healing and so he would not give up on them he would continue to pray and pray and pray uh, and uh, god used him in that way uh, one of the uh, you know uh, an event that happened written by his uh, um, colleague uh, missionary colleague of his uh, they were going into some town uh, uh, in England, and uh, uh, when he went there, the the, the 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 meetings were for about three, four days, conventions and meetings. So they expected crowds of ten thousand, fifteen thousand people at one time. Uh, so this one night, uh, one evening, the whole day they were they were preaching, and Smith Wigglesworth was tired, and he came back home uh, to the hotel room that they had for him and his. Uh, uh, companion and during the night uh, this is written by his companion who stayed with him at that time uh, during the night there was a you know sound and uh, you know apparently demons were making so much sound the tables were all shaking the chairs were shaking the bed was shaking and uh, his this companion of his could not sleep and he was trembling in fear but Smith Wiggles was, was fast asleep because he was very tired and so his friend and companion woke up Smith Wigglesworth and said, uh, look what's happening. You know, you know uh, demons are trying to disturb us and shaking the table. All the things from the table started falling off. And Smith Wigglesworth woke up. He looked at it. He looked at what's happening and he said, uh, uh, okay, it's only you. I'll see you tomorrow. And he went back to sleep. So uh, basically, you know, trying to show that, you know, I don't have time for you, devil. Uh, it's you, it's somebody who's already been defeated, so I'll see you tomorrow. So that event really shook up this, uh, you know, this companion, but uh, it shook him in such a way that he decided to go back home. Uh, but Smith Wigglesworth was known for that. Right? He would pray and demons will flee. Uh, sick people were made free also. Then uh, we look at John G. Lake, another young man. He gave up a successful uh, newspaper and real estate business uh, and he began to minister healing. Now, John G. Lake's uh, uh, ministry is a powerful ministry. Uh, there are plenty of books on it. Uh, many of them have written about his, uh, his uh, revival, the outpouring that happened during his time. Uh, he spent a lot of time in South Africa and after about five years in South Africa, uh, John G. Lake saw 10 lakh people who converted and gave their lives to Christ, planted hundreds of churches, raised up about 1,000 local ministries. And then after spending this, all this happened in five years. Right? 10 lakh believers, hundreds of churches, thousands of ministries, local ministries were started. After returning back to the US, um, he started something called as the healing room. Now, even now when in some churches, plenty of churches have something called as a healing room where they would take people 
who are sick or people who are sick who can go into the healing room and you have leaders and uh, you know pastors leaders uh, praying over them for healing so he started something called as a healing rooms and uh, over 100000 people reported healing uh, during this time and uh, it was in this phase where uh, you know uh, washington in uh, washington was uh, you know, uh, pronounced as the healthiest city in the United States because of this ministry of John G. Lake. So uh, now it is. There's so much more that John G. Lake went through. Uh, even in his younger days, people ridiculed him. Uh, people were uh, unaware or not. They were not comfortable in the way he would minister, and there were a lot of uh, you know difficulties that he went through. But he, you know, and that's why he didn't want to get into, you know, ministry. He always wanted to do uh, some kind of a business, and so he became a successful businessman. But later on, God called him to full-time ministry, and so this ministry uh, of John G. Lake impacted hundreds and thousands of lives. Lives were touched so powerfully. Healings were uh, be had become a normalcy. Now we must understand. Now this is almost the early 1900s and during this time uh, there was a lot of you know on the flip side of the coin now we've been studying revivals and all of that but on the flip side on the other side there was a lot of uh, you know uh, influence of uh, the greek influence that was moving across the world so that was more of worship of uh, pagan gods uh, calling on spiritualism, like calling on, uh, you know, uh, uh, praying to the stars, praying to the moon, and uh, all kinds of other, uh, you know, uh, new kind of doctrines had started up. Uh, right now, we must remember where the work of the Holy Spirit is. The enemy is also trying his best to stop it. Right, so it's not like okay, revival is happening, and everything. Uh, is all right. No, there are time, there are places where you know the work of the enemy was very very prevalent, and uh, uh, a lot of these you know who were revivalists were later. Uh, we would look at even when we look at key observations, we would look at some of their failures, how they fell to sin. Right? Of course, God used them to do powerful works, uh, but even in through all of that. The enemy was able to, you know, uh, cause them to sin, cause them to fall, and uh, which also uh, had a effect on the body of Christ. Now, even as we look at this century as well, God has used many powerful leaders, many powerful, uh, you know, prophets and evangelists, uh, but many of them have also fallen. Uh, so it's very important that if God is using us. Uh, to also remember that there's an enemy trying to, you know, uh, stop the work of God. Uh, reminded of uh, what uh, Peter writes, and he says, uh, the enemy is like a roaring lion trying to devour uh, his people. So, so it's so yes, there are there there was a work of God, but the enemy was also doing his work. So, uh, but. It could not be as strong as the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was just moving so powerfully. Uh, right? Uh, I was reading this book which said that you know, if, if the enemy wants to destroy or or stop a ministry, he's going to start from top and then come down. Right? Uh, so even us as leaders. Now, we may be leading in the church, we may be uh, pastors, some of us. We are to be doubly careful uh, in our lives. We need to keep, protect our lives from every angle, every side. Right? And we say, God, uh, you have called me for this. Help me to be faithful, cover me. And then we continue to live out our life day after day uh, in the presence of God. But remember that the enemies. The enemy starts off from the top. If he wants to destroy a work, he starts from the top and then goes down, right? So, uh, so yes, uh, there were many challenges that people went through during these times as well. Amy Simple McPherson was an 
uh, was an evangelist, a healing evangelist. And uh, she started something called as the Four Square Churches. Right? Uh, that was the name of her ministry, the Four Square Gospel. And uh, she planted plenty of churches, about 1,700 churches in the U.S. And there were about 66,000 meeting places uh, around the world. Uh, so this comes to an end of uh, the 19th century. We come into the 20th and the 21st century. So a, a time when maybe most of us may have heard of ministries uh, during these times. So uh, this is more recent to what, uh, what we have been studying. So uh, let's look at a few of them. Charles Fox Parham. Uh, now, on page 52, Charles Fox Parham uh, was a young man, an itinerant uh, evangelist, and uh, he was longing for an outpouring of God. Right? Uh, he would pray every day. He would seek the word. He would, he, you know, it was said that he would pray, saying that, "God, you have done all of this in the past. These revivals, uh, you should do it even now." So uh, he was burdened in his heart to see revival. Uh, he spent many a days, many a nights uh, praying. And uh, what he did was he started a small Bible school with about 40 students. And he said, OK, we are going to study the book of Acts. We're going to study how in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon people and what happened after that. And so all the students began to study when uh, Charles Fox began to study about the book of Acts. And after a, a period of studying, they came to this conclusion. Now, if we have to see revival, we have to do two things. One, humble ourselves. Two, pray. Right? Prayer, humble ourselves and pray. And the more we do that, the more the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to come. And then they said, okay, how, how do we know that the outpouring has happened? One of the best signs is speaking in tongues. And so uh, Charles Fox, with his 40 students, they would spend days and nights continually praying for a revival. Um, then there came a time when they started having uh, you know, small meetings in different places, and hundreds and people started coming. Thousands of people started coming. And then we, they realized, okay, we need to stop doing all the, you know, the other, what do you call it, normal activities. And we need to dedicate our time to prayer and reading of the word of God. So what happened was many of them uh, uh, experienced the outpouring. And uh, the name of the college was Bethel Bible College in uh, Kansas. And many of them experienced the move of the Holy Spirit. A great outpouring. People from different countries started to come. And they wanted to attend Bethel Bible College in Kansas. And uh, uh, he opened uh, later on, Parham, uh, Charles Fox, he opened up a new Bible college or Bible school in Houston. And when he was there, uh, a great man named William J. Seymour, we'll talk about him later on. His name is maybe uh, you know familiar. He started the Azusa Street Revival. William J. Seymour uh, came to attend this school. He was again baptized by the Holy Spirit and God used William J. Sabor to do a great revival in England. Uh, so Charles Fox started with what he had. It is said that his Bible school didn't have facilities. He started in a, you know, in a house which he had rented out uh, for a while, and and then later on, we don't know how they managed with hundreds and thousands of people, but God provided. If God is, you know, making a move. Or if there is an outpouring, God will provide the means as well, right? So hundreds and thousands of people graduated out of this Bible college, which started with 40 people, right? 40 people, simple, small beginnings. Out of the 40, it is said that most of them were girls, and he was a little bit of, uh, worried. Okay, uh, we wanted to, you know, we wanted also people, uh, men who can, um, you know, it should be a combined effort of men and women. But most of them were girls, but we see that God used them. God used them so powerfully uh, that the message of the gospel went through different parts. People came from different parts of the world 
to encounter what is happening in this Bethel Bible College. Then we look at um, John Hyde. Uh, in the early 1900s, John Hyde, uh, and he's an American Presbyterian missionary, John Nelson Hyde. He was known as the Praying Hyde. Now, he was a man of prayer, right? Uh, when we say prayer, he would pray for hours. There are times that, uh, you know, uh, John Hyde came to India, right? He came to a place in Punjab called Sailcourt. Uh, and when he came to Punjab, he began to pray for revival in Punjab. Right? He said, God, make a move in this place. You know, Hyde began prayer meetings, which started with about 10 people. He would pray from 10 a.m., 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., right? Continual prayer, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. He would wake up, he would go drink some tea or drink some water. He would come, he would kneel, and he would pray, right? That's why he was called the praying hide. He would pray and pray and pray nights after nights. You know, there were times when uh, his his uh, church people would say, you need to rest. You can't do this. You can't be the, you know, you need to eat. You need to, uh, you need rest to help you do, do ministry. But uh, he said, no, until I see revival, until I see an outpouring, I will not rest. Uh, and he prayed and prayed and prayed. It is said that when he died, uh, you know, he had like uh, camel hooves on his knees, right? Uh, camel hooves. Uh, if you've seen that, you know, his knees were bent in because of the times of praying on his knees. It is, uh, and also uh, in his, you know, prayer room, his study room in his, in Punjab, uh, sail court. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's still a, a site of remembrance or a place where people have kept that open, but it is said that next to his bed there were two small holes on the ground the ground itself had two small holes and then somebody asked him what are those two holes near the ground and they said that that is john hyde's uh, knees that he would spend hours on his knees praying uh, so what happened was he felt a strong urge he that india can be saved only through prayer and so he started this prayer movement. He, the Holy Spirit moved. There was a move of God. People were filled with the Holy Spirit. He started the Punjab Prayer Union. There was a great revival in Punjab. Many prayer rooms were open. Churches were packed. People began to search for places to sit. Um, people came, uh, came in for whole full nights of prayers. Right? Imagine, so you're talking about a nation like India and that too in Punjab, and people came for entire night press. I don't think anybody will do it now, right? Uh, even with our AC halls and comforts and fans and all of those things, you won't be able to do an entire night of prayer. But they did nights of prayer, entire night praying for the nation, praying for people. Right. Uh, and then, you know, he because of that, there was an outpouring in Punjab. Many people, uh, many Sikhs accepted Christ. Uh, but later on, it said that, you know, uh, many of them did not get rid of their turbans and all of that. They kept it uh, and they began to testify about Jesus. Many people were killed during this time. Many people were martyred for the sake of the gospel. Uh, the uh, Those who... Uh, came out of their religion, who accepted Christ, were rejected, were scorned upon uh, for the choices that they had made. But, but the but the work was already done. Pe the move of the Holy Spirit began to empower people. Punjab began to see an outpouring of God. Missionaries, uh, new ministries were birthed, new pastors, new uh, local churches were formed. Churches began to thrive. Missionaries came in to different from different parts of the world to India to continue this, you know, outpouring that had already started. So, John Hyde, one of his most famous saying was, "Lord, give me souls, or I die." 
uh, that was his prayer give me souls or i'll die uh, and, and so he was a man of fervent fervent prayer uh, times of uh, you know it is said that uh, he was on a sick bed right uh, or, or almost on his deathbed so he had a servant and he would tell his servant uh, please come at this time carry me and put me on my knees next to my bed and uh, because i need to pray so his servants would say you don't have to do this you can pray on your bed uh, but he said no you come so they would carry him they would place him on his knees next to his bed and he would say come back after four or five hours uh, and he would spend those four or five hours just praying um, history says that uh, he also passed away in that position as he was praying kneeling and praying uh, on his bed he also breathed his last uh, on his knees and what a sacrifice what a sacrifice coming into uh, you know from america coming into our nation coming into punjab starting a work touching many lives um, and starting many ministries that are even continuing to this day thousands of people brought to Christ through this ministry. And we look at another woman named Pandit Ramabai, and she started the Mukti Mission Revival. Pandit Ramabai was a Brahmin, uh, born a Brahmin family, but she became a believer in Christ. Now, the moment she became a believer a few years later, she started something called as the Sharada Sadan, which is a house of learning. Basically, this is was in Bombay for people who were, uh, you know, the Brahmins, what they would do is the young girls would be married off to older Brahmin men, uh, maybe because of their, uh, you know, the culture and also because uh, they were Brahmins and also because of, you know, uh, financial, they have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, things set uh, for the family uh, material things everything was said so they, so what they would do was they would marry off these young girls to elderly brahmin men and so those men would die and then these girls would be about very young 20 21 years old so what she would do pandita ramabai she would take these brahmin girls who are widows and uh, she would you know keep them in their home and uh, teach them the word of god uh, and slowly this mukti mission had about 2000 girls in the school uh, but one of the things that pandit ramabai she always prayed for was revival so she had read about the revivals that happen in wales so what she said was okay they they prayed so we need to do the same thing so she formed prayer teams prayer groups within the um, uh, within the within the girls and they prayed earnestly for revival now the moment they began to pray about six months later there was a powerful outpouring of god uh, all the 2000 girls accepted christ these 2000 girls said we want to go out on missions and we want to teach other people and so this whole thing of uh, you know the mukti mission revival it was like a chain reaction every time people would come into this home uh they would they would experience or encounter the uh, the lord jesus and they would go out wanting to you know do ministry and to spread the gospel of christ so pandit ramabai even though she herself did not go out and do any missions she stayed in her hometown itself but she was able to experience the move of god where thousands of girls thousands of people uh you know accepted christ in the city of bombay um bombay was known for its prostitution it was it was something in the open and uh she was uh very instrumental in saving these uh, girls who went out on prostitution she also saved them she brought them into these homes provided them education uh, and and they encountered the love of christ who went out and began to share the gospel so the same way uh another person we we talk about is the azusa street revival right now 
Azusa Street Revival was started off by uh, William J. Seymour. Now, most of us may know him, or we may have heard of William J. Seymour or the Azusa Street Revival. Now, here's what happened. The Azusa Street is a narrow street uh, at a commercial complex, right? So it's, it's just like a, a T intersection. And at the corner of that intersection was a small, uh, like a go down, right? And there were about 50 people in the church. So it's called, that street was called the Azusa Street. And so William J. Seymour uh, was a young man. I remember, he went to Bethel Bible uh, School. And he said, OK, he was chosen as a pastor in uh, this church. And it was a Pentecost church. So uh, the Azusa Street, in that place, he began to pray. He said, God, pour out your revival like never before. Because there were times he would go to church, he would open the church, and there would be 30 people in the church, 20 people in the church. And so he would be so burdened, said, why is it we are in a good location, uh, the church is in a good location, why is it that people are so complacent? Why are they not able to come to church? Right. So he was very burdened on that. So he said, he decided, he tried to do a lot of things, you know. It is said that William J. Seymour was very good. Uh, he had very good oratory skills. So he said, he thought to himself that he will, you know, have these meetings and that meeting. But nobody turned up in, in those meetings. And uh, there was a time he realized that he has to pray for revival. He began to read books uh, or read uh, articles on how revival happened in the early churches. And he was burdened in his heart. He began to small, uh, uh, you know, he began to form a small prayer group uh, in the in his house and people's homes. And he, for three years, they continually prayed for revival. Right now, after three years, what happened was there was a massive outpouring. All of a sudden, one Sunday, he opens the church. There are 200 people. What was 30, 40 people? Now there's 200. Then there was 500. All happening in a few weeks. By the end of two months, there were 3,000 people in the church. Right? And so he didn't know what to do. There was no place. People would come with umbrellas. And initially, where you know nobody would come to church, he used to open the church and you know he used to do everything. Now, when he would when he would come to church, the line would go all till the end of the street. People holding umbrellas. So he started new services, 6 a.m. service, 8 a.m. service, 10 a.m. service. So he started different services. All the services were packed. Then he said, OK, we need to move to a bigger place. So they've got a bigger place. And uh, by the end of the revival, there were about 10,000 odd people added into the church his church and then that movement went in and touched different parts of the world iceland tanzania uh, america uh, europe asia so that revival began to spread out what started off in a small prayer group of 50 people 30 to 50 people turned out to be ten thousands of people and William J. Seymour was, you know, invited to preach in different countries wherever he went. Later on, those churches or those ministries also experienced an outpouring of God. Uh, the Azusa Street Revival is known as the most impactful revival because it was a time when England was a completely dry nation. The word was there, the Bibles were there, ministries were there, missions was there, all of it was there. But somewhere down the line, that spiritual fervor had come down. But God used this man, William J. Seymour, to revive what was almost dying. Uh, you know, the, the whole thing in three years, God powerfully, you know, the, the outpouring spread like fire. Right? Just picture this. Main Street, you got a small church of 50 people. Nobody even knows about that. Three years later, you got thousands of people standing outside with umbrellas in the rain to get to place in the church. What was that change? What happened in those three years? Those three years was a year of 
prayer and dedication and calling out in the name of God. God was faithful to answer it. Right. Then the last person that we'll talk about today is Sadhu Sundar Singh. Now, we mo most of us Indians may have heard, and even others uh, here may have heard of this man named Sadhu Sundar Singh, a powerful, powerful man, born in a Sikh family in Punjab. He was very hostile towards uh, the Christians, but Sadhu Sundar Singh came to know Christ through the sale court, uh, you know, revival that happened through John Hyde. Uh, and he, on his 16th birthday, he accepted the Lord and was baptized on his 16th birthday. Now, as a teenager, he dedicated his life to Christ. He said, uh, this is what I want to do. I want to travel and I want to preach the gospel to places. So he moved, went to Punjab, Kashmir, Afghanistan, parts of Pakistan, spent most of his life as a nomad, living in mountainous areas, living among uh, tribes, living among the animals, the dangerous animals. And uh, there are plenty of uh, books and encounters that uh, Sadhu Sundar Singh had uh, during his walk with God. Uh, it is said that you know when Sadhu Sundar Singh walked in the streets, people in their homes who were possessed by demons would begin to manifest. He would not even pray for them. He would just be walking down the street. And so they would carry these people. And you know, it was a picture of you know, Jesus himself, uh, where they would carry these demon-possessed people, sick people. So that's what they did. And Sadhu Sundar Singh dedicated his entire life just praying and uh, you know, moving from place to place. Uh, sharing the gospel there are you know uh, there was this one time when one of the other missionaries wanted to write about you know uh, sadhu sundar singh and as he came for that interview it is said that they could not take his interview because the person who was taking the interview was convicted of sin and he was fallen on the ground crying and crying. and so they had to call somebody else to come and take the interview that man said i cannot look at his face because the glory of god is upon his face so we will need to postpone this interview so this is just an example it didn't happen all the time but just an example of uh, you know uh, how uh, sadhu sundar singh was he was a very very gentle person very patient it is said that uh, in another instance they had called him uh, uh, to to you know to just like you know to do an interview uh, and to talk about what ministry is and how they came to know about Christ. They said that uh, as they were doing the interview, they saw uh, you know the image of Christ on his face, meaning like Christ would have been this way uh, because he, he so gentle, so tender so loving yet so powerful in words and deeds and actions sadhu sundar singh was a man of faith he touched many lives um, and again he also gave his life for the sake of the gospel it is said that when he entered nations like pakistan and afghanistan uh, you know they had plotted to kill him uh, so they were the I think it was Pakistan. I'm not sure if it's Pakistan or Afghanistan, but one of these two places they plotted, they were waiting. They knew that he's going to come. They were waiting to kill him. And uh, these people went trying to kill him. But when they went there, they saw his face and the glory of God around him. They said that we cannot go near this man because there are some kind of uh, big, uh, you know, angels kind of people, big uh, bodyguards around him who protect him so we cannot uh, you know uh, attack this man we cannot kill him uh, and so all these instances happened in uh, sadhu sundar singh's life and he again uh, you know was impactful in reaching to many lives across our nation all right so we'll stop here we have about 5 minutes more uh, any of you like have any questions anything that you want to share uh, any thoughts that you have, uh, you can feel free to share just five minutes and, we can, and then we can close. What do you think, uh, maybe some of you can share, what do you think, uh, uh, you know, 
do can we see revival now what is the things that you feel that we are lacking right all of us uh, uh, as a body of christ and even as individuals what is it that you think that we are lacking that you feel that we should you know uh, improve on any thoughts on that yes go ahead samuel listening to these stories pastor um these these seem like super human like you know super i mean i don't think it's humanly possible i don't think that there's there, there's anything that i can do from my end to reach any such stature and i mean the only reasonable answer that i can come up with is i think these people were 100% surrendered to god like they were not like you know i'm going to go out and influence people today but they were more like god use me and uh, whatever you do I'll, whatever you ask me to do i'll do and i think that gave them so it's it's i think very fundamental but at the same time it's it's so hard like because as human beings we tend to naturally depend on our ability to speak or to think or to do and 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 to give up on that dependency and to rely on god 100% Uh, I think that's what I'm thinking would be needed. Uh, so that's that's yeah. what. Yeah. And thank you, Samuel. Yeah, that's good. That's uh, it's good thoughts. But uh, I like what you said. They were hundred percent all out for the sake of the gospel. So that that is very true. But um, Samuel, uh, we all can press on for that. Right? We, uh, like you said, you mentioned that. You know, I don't think you. i would be able to but we can you know uh, now just because now see even as we studied uh, uh, you know these revivalists now they did make mistakes now they went all out for god uh, but then they didn't look after their family right uh, we studied about uh, you know even william carey he lost his wife he lost his kids um, his children at a very young age so Uh, now it's important that yes god has called us to you know call for an outpouring to pray for a revival but god has also given us the responsibility to look after our family now we can't say okay uh, no for example we have a wife and two small kids uh, or a small child right uh, we can't say okay god uh, i'm all out for the gospel so leave the wife and children let them figure out what to do and you know you, that is wrong because you know god has you know paul writes to timothy and he said if we don't know how to look after our family how will we look after the body of christ right uh, yes 100% is required uh, but there's also the aspect of looking after and later on we also saw that a lot of revivalists these missionaries were so you know focused on the missions that they also forget their health a uh, lot of them Uh, died at a young age right uh, even uh, uh, i forget his name but uh, he went on the horse back to africa uh, to uh, sorry to the native americans uh, adonai ram jatson he died at 27 because of tuberculosis if he had spent some time you know maybe just uh, getting his health treated he would have been able to do much more than what he was doing so so yes samuel i feel that we can press for that but also be responsible to look after things that god has put in our place yeah uh, rose says we lack commitment in prayer and we are inconsistent in asking from god very true very true uh i i believe in that inconsistent is true because sometimes we ask ask then after a couple of months like okay god maybe you don't want it or maybe god you uh, want to do it through somebody else uh so yes we we don't wait long enough to allow god to move true that is true uh especially during this time and age where everything's instant uh waiting is something that we don't want to do but uh, uh so that's a good learning uh, isaiah you know uh through the prophet isaiah god speaks to his children and he says those who wait upon the lord shall renew their strength right so it's very important to wait on god Uh, and i think yes i think uh, this waiting time is the most difficult time right? because nothing's happening so god what are you doing can you please tell me is it one year is it five years so that i be prepared 
and especially when god is not you know s- speaking the way you know no dreams no word of knowledge nothing it gets hard but uh, we need to be consistent in our prayer and asking god yes kennedy says lukewarmness and lack of prayer life is the current problem and too much comfort today unlike the earlier brothers yes uh, too much comfort true uh, we don't want to step out of our comfort zone uh, uh, but yes god you know it's not that god wants us to struggle and do ministry no a ministry should be a joy there's comfort but the comfort should not stop us from you know what god has for us so god is uh, you know saying okay i want you to go to this place uh it's not going to be as comfortable as you want it to be but then you know uh, i'm going to be uh, my grace is sufficient for you the moment we look at it that way yes we will be able to overcome yes but too much comfort is definitely one of the reasons why we don't see an outpouring of god uh christopher uh no christopher we still didn't do the welsh revival and even roberts the reason i didn't cover it here is because in the following chapter we are going to do it uh, uh more uh, you know uh, here it's very very it's this small portion but then we want to discuss more on the welsh revival in the coming chapter so we'll do it in the next chapter as well so yes. all right so we passed that time now uh, anybody would like to close in prayer right felix can you close in prayer please shall pray go ahead. father in the name of jesus we thank you for today's class we thank you for everything that we learned we thank you for everything that we've learned and the new things, we pray help us apply them. We pray committing the next class into your hands, help us in everything we do this, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Felix. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll catch up next Monday. Have a blessed week ahead. God bless. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. <laughs>